Yeah, first of all, welcome and thank you uh, for coming to this amazing panel on, uh, on biomanufacturing. I'll start with a quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm Vivek Arora. I'm a partner with McKinsey. I, um, I lead our work on manufacturing and supply chain in the life sciences industry uh, in North America. And over the last few months, I've been working closely with MassBio, partnering with them on, um, on the topic of biomanufacturing. And the reason uh, why we are talking about, um, about biomanufacturing today is because, I mean, as you've, as you've all heard and as you all know, uh, that while Massachusetts is the most vibrant and the leading global hub when it comes to, um, uh, uh, when it comes to life sciences innovation, but when we talk about biomanufacturing, we are indeed lagging um, uh, as compared to several hubs, not just in North America, of course, but globally as well. I mean, if you look at some of the indicators, um, uh, while it was mentioned in the morning that uh, you know, over the last five years, the contribution of biopharma in terms of GDP has of course increased from four billion to I think close to eight billion. It contributes uh, close to 1.4% to our overall GDP. A and when we compare that with other clusters like for instance, um, uh, for instance, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina, they are upwards of 2%. Also, when we look at some of the other indices around uh, how much is the bio manufacturing GDP contribution per asset, we are close to around 11 million, and I would say it's less than half, or even lower when um, actually compared with some of the other states and clusters as well. So we indeed have a lot of catching up, um, and, and uh, as was uh, also spoken in the morning, competition is on our heels. The good part is that if we can, if we can get it right, the upside is tremendous. Um, if we can uh, even match some of the other states I spoke about, we can close to double uh, the contribution uh, in terms of GDP. That's, uh, I would say, in between six to 10 billion over the next five to seven years. Uh, this could also result in, in between one to two billion of tax revenue for the state. And I think uh, in terms of jobs, our estimate is that, I mean, it could create more than 30,000 direct manufacturing jobs, which has an indirect impact on close to 80,000 additional jobs as well. Our research also indicates that uh, in general, biomanufacturing jobs are more diverse uh, as compared to R&D and some of the other functions. And uh, uh, because the educational barrier in biomanufacturing is also, is also low, it makes our industry more accessible and more equitable as well. But, of course, the question is how, right? We all know that this is the time. Uh, you know, our estimate says that the biomanufacturing in, uh, industry globally is actually growing at close to 14%. Uh, there are several segments like uh, in cell and gene therapies, vaccines, mRNA, where we still are supply constrained. I think supply chain disruptions and resilience is, I think, still a hot topic. And there is a lot of push that's happening on, uh, on creating self-reliance when it comes to manufacturing. But the question is, how do we make it happen? So that's the objective of the panel discussion that we have today. I mean, we, of course, have assembled an amazing and a, a very distinguished panel. And along with them, we'll start to explore on what can we do as a state, as an ecosystem, to actually get more manufacturing in, my, um, in the state. Um, to actually get us started, I'll just request um, everybody on the panel to, um, to give a brief intro about their background and speak about their association with Massachusetts and uh, how and why they are so passionate about the topic of biomanufacturing. So I guess maybe we'll st uh, we start with you, Ran. Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, great to see you. Uh, my name is Ran Zen. I'm CEO of Landmark Bio. Landmark Bio was a uh, was co-founded by Harvard, MIT, and the three industry partners, Sativa, Fujifilm, uh, and Alexandria Real Estate, along with the five research hospitals, Boston Children, Beth Israel, Dana-Farber, uh, Mass General, and Brigham Women. The uh, objective of Landmark Bio is to accelerate a tremendous innovation we have seen in life sciences, particularly in advanced therapies. So we are based in Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, you know, the reason that we're based here is that uh, you know, this is such a vibrant uh, life sciences ecosystem. And uh, with our co-founders um, being uh, in Massachusetts, we see tremendous opportunities to access to talent. 
But most importantly, the opportunities to capitalize on the research and innovation that we have seen in the academic and early research setting. Uh, to be able to strengthen Massachusetts as a leaders in life sciences for years to come. Thanks, Ron. David? Hi. Uh, David Conley. Uh, right now I'm the Director of Engineering and Capital Expansion for Rentschler Biopharma. Uh, Rentschler Biopharma is a uh, contract development manufacturing organization um, based out of uh, Laupheim, Germany. Um, just recently they uh, took our first step in uh, bringing uh, the, the company presence to the United States um, and, and Massachusetts was uh, the, the leading decision location for them. Um, previous experience in uh, validation at uh, companies like AstraZeneca, Baxalta. Um, I've been uh, born and raised in uh, Massachusetts, um, you know, and continue to uh, continue to work here and really excited about uh, the expansion of manufacturing capabilities in, in Mass. Awesome. Dennis? Hello, everyone. My name's uh, Dennis Wong. I'm the Chief Technical Operations Officer for Ultragenics. Um, my association with Massachusetts, even though we're a California-based um, biotech company, we focus on rare diseases and treating uh, uh, those conditions for rare and ultra-rare patients. Um, our association with Massachusetts really came in, in, in 2017 when we acquired a company called Dimension Therapeutics, which at the time was uh, focused on AEV gene therapy, and so um, you may, if you've listened to uh, Governor Healy this morning, you may have heard her mention uh, a new plant that we're, manufacturing plant that we're uh, building and um, just about to finish up actually in, in Bedford. Um, and so our association has been really inventing, uh, investing in that gene therapy platform and uh, enabling us to access diseases in ways that uh, we, we previously couldn't. So. Uh, that's how come we're in Massachusetts. Awesome. Thanks, Dennis. Stuart. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Stuart McNall. I'm the business unit head uh, for the Biologics and Vaccines franchise for Resilience. Uh, Resilience is a biomanufacturing uh, services company. Um, we, we've invested quite a bit in new technologies, but the end goal is to drive those to the lab and manufacturing floor to be a better service provider. Um, so. It's, uh, you know, a lot, most of our biologic sites are on the East Coast um, and with three sites here in the Boston area. So certainly it's a, it's a big draw for us. Having a presence here is extremely important uh, as being a service provider and wanting to obviously grow a client base, but also the, the technology base here, you know, the, the scientists and the, yeah. the, the, the talent here is just really impressive. So um, it's always a joy to come visit the sites. I don't live here myself, but I'm, I'm here quite often each month. So. Okay. That's fantastic. Thanks, Stuart. So, um, I mean, it's very clear that uh, the state plays a, a, a key part in the overall biomanufacturing network of all the companies, right? So I think just to get the discussion started, maybe with you, Ron, I mean, uh, just explain to us, like, um, how did the uh, choice of Massachusetts really happen? So how did you guys decide that, you know, sort of uh, uh, you, you wanted to have, to have your network and manufacturing here in the state? And how exactly is that uh, actually gone for you, like just share with us the experience about that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, it's actually quite a remarkable story. Way back in 2017, Alan Garber, the provost of Harvard University, actually convened a group of life sciences leaders from academia, from industry, uh, also from government, as well as the VC communities to explore what a cross-sector joint venture could really help accelerate the innovation we have seen in this field. If you recall, 2017 is a remarkable year for cell and gene therapies. That year, we had two cell therapy products and one gene therapy product approved in the United States. There are a lot of excitement uh, in the academic and early stage company but those companies all face a tremendous challenges to bring the innovative ideas mm. from benches to bedside. So the, the, this group of leaders um, came together and uh, really identified a big challenges and big barriers uh, in the therapeutic translation is the lack of capability to develop the manufacturing process 
and to make the product so that it can be tested in human. So that was the origin of Landmark Bio, and it took uh, quite a few years for um, this group of leaders and, and come together and raise $75 million uh, to uh, identify a site to be the facility. And from the very beginning, mm -hmm. one of the big decision driver is to leverage the capabilities we're going to build to strengthen the leadership of Massachusetts in cell and gene therapy space. So that, that decision was pretty easy and straightforward. Mm -hmm. We want to build in Massachusetts, and not only that, we want to build close to where really the innovation occurs. So we're based mm -hmm. in Watertown, and it's close to the heart of uh, life sciences innovation. 15 minutes from uh, Longwood Medical Center and 20 minutes from Harvard and MIT. Our organization very much focused on technology development, technology innovation in the space of biomanufacturing and also leverage our expertise and experience as well as our process development laboratories and the GMP manufacturing facilities to really partner and help the early stage companies to move their assets um, further along in the development journey, and, and most importantly, capture the value and, and create a greater value, yeah. you know, before they exit. Awesome. Yeah. I would love to hear from you also, David. Like, um, you know, um, so you at Rentschler, of course, have a couple of facilities in Europe as well. You have one here in Milford, and that's the facility that the organization seems to have uh, chosen to invest behind, expand. So, how was th that decision made, and like, why, why Milford site? Yeah. Yeah, so that uh, you know decision was was based on a lot of different factors, um, and and I was you know uh, uh, a member of the existing site that Rentschler acquired at the time. But in speaking with a lot of the colleagues, um, and the decision was was quite evident, right? So we're we're a client facing um, organization, and um, there's a, a strong number of our clients have either headquarters or some sort of presence in the Boston, New England area. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was extremely important for us to be close to that and close to our clients. And, and it was something that a lot of our clients were asking uh, our site in Germany, when are you going to open in the U.S.? When are you going to open in the U.S.? So it really um, kind of stemmed from that. Um, there are a lot of other reasons that I think Rentschler may not have even realized or valued um, mm -hmm. at the time. Um, being so close to a lot of uh, state-of-the-art equipment manufacturers, um, you've got, you know, I, I won't list all the names, but there are a lot of leading manufacturers that are on the, the 495, the 95 Beltway. Um, so in the expansion of our facility, um, it's been very valuable having all of those technical resources mm -hmm. at our fingertips. You know, it's, it's not a phone call with, with support groups. Um, yeah. It really is, is right in Boston. And, yeah. um, you know, that was one of the leading things, um, as well as some of the, uh, the, the tax benefits. Um, so we, we, we have partnerships with uh, the um, New England, um, drawing a blank of the name now, but there are certain uh, programs that we've uh, partnered with uh, for benefits uh, through the construction process of our project. Um, and thirdly is also the, the talent pool. Um, you know, we've, we have partnerships with bio, um, Mass BioEd um, through WPI as well, um, and they have a lot of uh, strong apprenticeship programs where we actually uh, recently had uh, 10, 10 folks out of that program start with us. Um, so it really, you know, was based on the clients, but the, the benefits of being in that Boston area have, have really carried through for, for multiple reasons. That's fantastic. So I think it's very clear that, you know, uh, even, from, even from a biomanufacturing standpoint, access to a rich biotech innovation ecosystem, access to amazing talent, as well as proximity to R&D customers, you know, that actually makes uh, 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 the state a very attractive position um, in terms of manufacturing. But I, uh, I guess if we can move on um, onto the conversation and come to the, the most important question, right? I mean, it's clear from all the experiences that we've heard is that Massachusetts can indeed be um, uh, the home to very high quality advanced manufacturing, but the fact that it's not, right? So I think maybe with you, Dennis, uh, uh, to actually begin with, would love to understand, you know, just from your standpoint, what are some of the, the issues or challenges that actually come in the way of Massachusetts being the, the big global frontier for biomanufacturing? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, we recently went through, and I mentioned a little bit about uh, how we ended up with our footprint in, in uh, 
Massachusetts. And when we acquired Dimension, which is an AAV gene therapy sort of technology company, um, there were about 50 people uh, or so in the organization. Uh, we've now exceeded that to about 350 people because we've expanded in all the, mm. the know-how areas, both in the research side, uh, the pharmaceutical development or, or process development areas, quality areas, as well as now with our manufacturing plant in Bedford forming. And so for us, this has been a big investment and the, being close to the know-how of where that came from hmm. was a critically important for us. Hmm. Uh, when I was talking with the CEO, uh, my boss and, and uh, the board, it was really apparent that for advanced technologies where the know-how is critical, you've got to be close to where it is. Exactly. Um, I think um, from my perspective as well, and I look at the rich history within Biogen and you only have to walk through Logan <laughs> Airport to, to see the Biogen little yeah. things of and so forth. Um, you know, being in the industry for as long as I have, um, there are other technology curves, if you will, mm -hmm. that have existed in the past, right? So recombinant, the, the definition of biotech arguably came from recombinant proteins, right? And the whole monoclonal thing and all that kind of stuff. Early on, you know, that was very much a new niche area. And so Biogen, what did they do? They built their facility right next to their, their corporate headquarters, right? And then they evolved it to uh, when it became a little bit more sort of advanced, mature, then they migrated to North Carolina uh, because they provided more opportunities and the know-how was a little bit more sort of commoditized in mm. some sense or mm. more familiar and characterized well. So I do think that there's this maturity curve, a technology curve that inherently, particularly for technology-based companies, right? Moderna, clearly, right? Norwood, what they've done mm. there, mm. amazing, amazing yeah. opportunities. Yeah. But I would say that as the maturity of the technology evolves, other incentives become more important, mm -hmm. right? And so that know-how becomes sort of, uh, starts to become less important less as important. part of the part, mm -hmm. piece, big of the piece of pie. Yeah. And maybe Stuart, from your standpoint as well, right? I mean, you of course have multiple sites in the region, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, as you operate those, what are some of the, the issues or challenges that you observe that you believe, um, you know, they have to be alleviated if you have to, of course, do more manufacturing in the state? I mean, I think it's pretty natural that, um, you know, a research and technology center, whether it be Boston or South San Francisco mm -hmm. or you, you name your site in Europe, I mean, it's hard to do it all, right? So it's hard yeah. to be really great at that and be really great, perhaps, <laughs> at training manufacturing workforces. Like, to your point, come yeah. from a different, a different track in a lot of cases. So uh, some of that is you can only do so much in a given area. I think there are some economics at play. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not uncommon that... You know, if you're building a manufacturing site with a large uh, workforce and a large call space, do you want to be, uh, you know, in the middle of the city or do you want to be in a region that has, is, um, you know, more cost effective? Yeah. I, th I think that's part of it, too. You know, with training centers that are yeah. more training, you know, undergrad training and mm -hmm. even out of high school training, you know, towards being like really yeah. good operators. Right. You know, so, um, yeah, I, that's just a little bit of my perspective. So the area is yeah. not known as well. No, I think this is an important point for discussion, right? Because, uh, I mean, uh, you know, this helps us identify what are some of those root causes why we've been behind and that we have to address in terms of unlock. So I, w I would love to hear from you as well, David and Ron, then, yeah. on what from your standpoint have some of, uh, you know, uh, some of the operational challenges been that need to be overcome. Yeah, I think going, you know, hand in hand with what Stuart says, a lot of it is the, the training, right? You know, so there's, there's growth happening, but the, the people to, to operate mm. a lot of these facilities um, you know, need to, to get trained up. And it's, mm. it's, it's two different, you know, specialties, right? You have the, the lab, the scientist, the engineer, but then you also need to have the, the skill set of the people uh, operating the process equipment, the ma uh, maintenance techs, QA, QC. There's a whole different mm. um, talent pool that, that, that is needed, right? And um, these, are, these are, you know, critical roles in the operations of a facility on a day-to-day exactly. -day basis. Yeah. So uh, I, think, I think getting more apprenticeship programs, getting people more accustomed to the fact that that's a, a, a good career choice, a good opportunity as well, um, is, is a, good, uh, a, good, a good step in the right direction. And it'll likely take time. Yeah. Yeah. Your perspective, I, Ron? Yeah, no, I agree. And I think um, there's definitely a technology maturity curve mm. um, when you see the innovation um, occur and, and the first step to when, before you become a platform, before the innovation mm -hmm. become platform, and they tend to be closer 
to um, where it's originated. And, and that, to me, that, you know, I think Massachusetts has a huge advantage mm. because the saw and the gene is so early, there is no winner at the moment. There, the, we talk about the saw and the gene as if it's a single modality, but saw yeah. and the gene is so diverse so in terms diversity. of yeah. uh, the modality, you know, just within the cell product, and you have IPSC derived product, you have a CAR-T, you have a car in the k you have you know, other you know, cell, cell products, and then gene therapy, AV is dominating um, a, a viral vector, but there are new um, viral vectors out there, so it's a very diverse. So I think Massachusetts has a huge opportunities over there. I'm more of a student of, um, of the industry and also of the, um, the history, and I look at the, you know, what North Carolina as a state has been done mm -hmm. in strengthening the base of um, uh, manufacturing, bio manufacturing, and the mm -hmm. training of concentrated yeah. effort. Mm -hmm. And I also look at what Ireland has done, uh, you know, mm -hmm. for their neighbor and how they attract uh, companies to come to, to Ireland to really build this bio manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Uh, home for many, many large pharmaceutical companies. I think for Massachusetts, huge opportunities um, you know, for the state to consider a more concentrated, uh, more synchronized effort um, to, to really put the manufacturing on the map. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really, yeah. really important yeah. for the next well, I think if years. I try and summarize what I heard from the panel as well as what we see in some of the other uh, thriving clusters in North Carolina. Uh, you, of course, mentioned Ireland, as well as to some extent in Singapore as well. Yep, Singapore I think, for uh, sure. Exactly, so mm -hmm. I would broadly categorize under the uh, three buckets, right? I think the first one, which I think all of you spoke about, is on talent, right? Mm -hmm. the, the specific talent that we need in biomanufacturing, and I think more and more in, um, I would say, uh, in some of our advanced modalities where the FTE <coughs> needs for the same output as compared to small molecules is much higher, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there is absolutely a shortage of talent, specific talent that we need in biomanufacturing. Of course, as we discussed that, um, the education requirements for that is of course lower than what we need for R&D, but of course it requires a specific talent uh, that we have to build, right? So that, that I think is number one. Two, I think uh, somewhere we also spoke about, you know, uh, the operating costs as well. I think, I think across different industries, you know, I mean, we have seen that the cost of manufacturing, cost of real estate, cost of utilities, and some of the other operating costs also in the state are much higher, as well as, affo uh, as, well as affordability from a housing standpoint. Um, and I think overall lifestyle standpoint, I think that's something that also needs to be, that needs to be addressed. And I think the, the third one is around, you know, sort of, I would say, maybe fiscal incentives that, that need to be put in place to actually attract some of the companies and their investments into the state, right? So I think those are the three broad buckets in which I would, I would actually try and categorize what I just heard from you guys, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think one additional slice of the pie, right, mm -hmm. in the way you look at manufacturing and, and going back to what Ron had mentioned as well, because I think, again, one advantage, all biomanufacturing is not the same, I guess I'll say it that exactly. way, right? Mm -hmm. The platform pieces are a yeah. bit more uh, cookie cutter, for lack of a better phrase. You expect some efficiencies, you expect some things. Things that are truly cutting edge, hmm. which is where Massachusetts has its strongest foothold, I think are per perhaps the best place to, if you will, plant those seeds. Um, and then it's the second, third, fourth plant that you're building that exactly. then becomes more challenging where are the considerations. So it's, there's a life cycle component to this that I think um, Massachusetts appreciates but hasn't quite been able to capture how do I get that second, third, fourth plant? Uh, because I agree completely that, you know, you talk about gene therapy, there's, it's still the wild west from a certain <laughs> perspective. Nothing's been determined yeah. what the standards are going yeah. to be and it's all being figured out as yeah. we speak. And if we don't have a, a foothold in some of that, yeah. you're gonna end up with probably very little at the end. Yeah, exactly. So I think just then moving along to our, uh, probably our last question before we open it up, uh, to Q&A is just having spoken about all, all the the issues and the challenges that we face. What uh, what according to you are, I mean, if I was to ask you, three top unlocks that need to happen to actually put Massachusetts on the global map in terms of biomanufacturing, what would those be? And maybe we start with you, Stuart, this time. 
Okay, so I'm first on the hard question here. <laughs> um, to, to unlock more manufacturing in the area, um, I, I mean, I, I would start with workforce training programs. You know, I know WPI has one. Um, my point of reference is North Carolina, the mm -hmm. BTEC uh, uh, organization there that Gary Galeska leads. It's just, um, you know, when you hire a handful of people out of VTech, you, you get the fundamentals, you get people who can think on their feet, you get people that know uh, GMP aspects of documentation, data integrity. You know, those are all the fundamentals of what it takes to put together a facility that they can deliver, you know, reliably. So that, mm -hmm. that's what comes top of mind for me. Maybe Ron, if I can ask you to go next. Sure, um, I think it is a priority. The state need to put this as a priority. Dennis? Yeah, you know, um, my experience is probably a little more narrow in the sense that I have the, the pain, if you will, or the uh, recent information about re recent challenges we've had in building our own facility. And I would say one area, and I completely agree with the, the training piece and the priority piece, because I think to a large degree, and I think we've heard a lot, a lot of that today, is people understand those. One area that maybe I haven't heard too much about is is specifically infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and I became acquainted with, and I, and I don't live in uh, Massachusetts, but I came, became acquainted with uh, the power companies and the gas things and uh, Eversource and some of those other places. It is really tough mm -hmm. to get power to a manufacturing plant, uh, much tougher than I thought it would be for as mature a <laughs> place. And so I say that because I haven't without heard that, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's not as easy as just running a long extension cord. I know that part, but it is something <laughs> that, um, and, and I mentioned this to Secretary Howe, as well as like it's something that is maybe not, uh, depending on where you are in your process, if you will, of manufacturing, we found that to be a bit of a sticking point for us that required a lot of mm -hmm. uh, support from our government affairs group and uh, local politicians and just, you know, it was very helpful, fortunately, and we resolved it, but um, just something I hadn't expected per se. Uh, and, and just to relate to that, you know, some of our facilities here to do a modification or a project or a capital project internally, getting the permits and, and you know, all, all that is, it takes time. It's hard. Yeah, particularly and, in Cambridge or yeah, some yeah, of the places. Yeah. Yep. Hey, David, so any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it goes back also to the, the infrastructure to support the manufacturing facilities as well, right? And you were touching on a lot of the... Um, you know, utilities, et cetera, but also mm -hmm. the supply chain aspect of it, yep. right? So, you know, and I guess this isn't a Massachusetts specific topic, but bringing a lot of manufacturing components and raw materials back to the United States, mm -hmm. right? So um, some of the biggest challenges, you know, that, that we face starting up a plant are, you know, electrical components and, and you know, breakers. Disposables. Tech, disposables, single, not to, you know, if there's any manufacturers in here, but uh, yeah, <laughs> disposables are still, you know, a long lead time. Exactly. And, and I know that they're in process of building up a lot of their um, their their support infrastructure as well to, to better supply us. Um, but it really is is the support infrastructure of the, the you know, the, the raw material pr components um, as well as, you know, c constructing, right? So, um, you know, electrical breakers are at, you know, two years lead time. <laughs> so. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> So. That's fantastic. Good. So I guess maybe on that note, we can uh, pause the conversation and open it up to, uh, to Q&A. Maybe if you can get the mic back there. Yes, please. Hi. <clears throat> um, I wanted to touch on two points that were raised. One of them was talent and training. And um, one of the gaps that I've been on, around a little bit and worked at several CDMOs and also innovative companies. And what, you know, a lot of these training programs, they'll be R&D focused or they'll be manufacturing focused. What we need is talent that can take a bench process, understand it at that scale, and then understand the industrial applications of what that means, you know, how does that translate? So these training programs that are being developed in different cities, but Massachusetts speci specifically, and I've heard about this a few times, should really consider how to bridge that gap because I think that is what's missing, um, you know, that talent, that ability to be able to do that. Um, yeah. And, and it, it's rare because most people either take the track of R&D or they take the track of manufacturing 
and they don't communicate well, and these problems will, will come up during so-called tech transfer. Oh, just, just died. I don't know. I have a loud voice. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so that's one comment, I guess, I just wanted to write. And then the other comment I wanted was about the cost of manufacturing and having manufacturing in an expensive area. So the thing about this area is you've got such a robust pipeline of emerging companies, and the conundrum is they don't have money. <laughs> and um, yet, they're also the ones that don't want their manufacturing to be far away from them. Exactly. Um, mm. So you know, it's, it's a real interesting problem, because as, the, as their product gets more mature and their funding increases, then they can send it away somewhere where the cost of manufacturing is much cheaper. So to me, that, that's a, like a challenge, you know, that, that question. Because, yeah. you know, one of the things that I ran into is, is the baby, right? They don't want to let go of the baby. And, um, and, you know, in order to not let go of the baby, yeah. you're going to have to pay a lot of money to keep it nearby. So anyway, those were my comments. <laughs> Any thoughts from the panelists on, on either of those two points? I think you're spot on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, a, on some of those topics. Yeah. I guess the only comment I would make on that question, and then we'll move to the next question over here, is that uh, specifically on the topic of cost, I absolutely agree with what you said. Although, uh, just based on some of um, the manufacturing benchmarking uh, that we at McKinsey have done over hundreds of sites, I think a couple of observations. First of all is that, you know, I mean, uh, uh, we see tremendous variability, sort of uh, uh, inefficiencies across different sites when it comes to advanced manufacturing. You know, it could be in between like 5x to, you know, close to, uh, close to you know, sort of, uh, I mean, even more than that. So the point is that some of the well-run sites in the Massachusetts area have the potential of being more efficient and more effective as compared to some of the not so well run sites <coughs> elsewhere as well. So, so in fact, our benchmarking indicates that some of the sites in Boston, even with the higher cost of labor, in terms of cost per batch or cost per unit are actually comparable, right? So, you know, so through automation, through digitization, through use of AI, I think some of these sites can actually become competitive and compete with the other uh, states and clusters as well. I just want to add one comment. Mm. I absolutely agree, and I think the location is not the only factor that affects the cost, mm. especially if you're uh, working on very cutting edge uh, as as uh, leading edge, and, and you actually do want to have the proximity with the manufacturers and with the partners over there. There's a hidden cost of tech transfer that people don't always see is that when you have a partner far away and you don't know what's going on over there and, and you try to figure out, you incur failure rate. So I think the, the, the proximity, particularly for early stage companies, I would highly recommend that you find a, um, a service providers or partners nearby and have an integrated approach um, when you develop your processes from early on from, from R&D and take it through the process development into manufacturing because that's your another comment is that how you know it's the trainings are separate mm -hmm. so uh, for an established technology mature technology you can actually have those separate trainings yep. but for some of the emerging technologies the development has to be integrated the training has to be integrated yep. this is where we're lacking as well Next question, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, this has been tremendously refreshing to, to, for everybody to realize just how difficult it is to actually build a biomanufacturing facility. So that's what we're trying to do at Phosphorix. We're based in Hopkinton. Um, we're going to be building a CDMO capability for nanomedicines. And as you say, supply chain, um, long lead items, generators, chillers, air handling units, and people are just impossible to, to manage right now. Um, so. We've talked a lot about the, today about the talent that's in this mass area, and we've always sort of looked at it from the, the top down, professors, PhDs, all that kind of thing. But today we've spoken about this panel, I think it's fantastic we've done this. We've talked about you know, QA specialists, environmental monitoring, um, the ability to have validation specialists, manufacturing operators, 
Uh, these are the people that actually do the work, that actually produce the, the life-saving drugs. Uh, and there's a, and a massive shortage of this. And how do we fix that problem? Because that is the bottleneck. Yeah. It's not the innovation at the top, guys. Exactly. It's, the, it's the actual hand on the bench or in the suite doing the work. So I think if we don't fix that, we're never going to get a biomanufacturing hub in, in yeah, this part of the world. Exactly. And the other issue we've had, particularly exacerbated by COVID, was not just finding the people, but keeping the people. If anybody runs a biomanufacturing facility here, you know that you've probably had 30% attrition rate, 40% attrition rate over the last two or three years. That's not sustainable either. So how do we make sure that we get people, we keep them, we train them, but then we don't have a situation where the next door company is just willing to pay them 10 grand more yeah. and take them. And it's a revolving door of talent and it just compounds this issue. So a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. I don't have all the answers, <laughs> um, but I'd be really interested to hear if the panel has some thoughts around that. Anybody? Yeah, maybe from uh, the innovator side of things, I, I do think uh, so, um, and I'll, I'll specifically talk about gene therapy because I think uh, certainly that's our footprint here in Massachusetts and I think correlates nicely with what you're saying as well. Um, the talent piece is always critical uh, as, as we've all acknowledged. I think um, I've noticed, because I also spent a lot of money with CDMOs, uh, that that has been a bit of a revolving door and the retention rate, as you point out, is very challenging. Um, I, I, I think that you know when you come to a place like the Boston area, you know, uh, within the 95 or even 495 uh, region, there's a lot of choice that you can have around this. And I, and I think fundamentally the way we've tried to deal with that is really create a culture, and not sell culture, but company <laughs> culture, that really attracts when you screen them in and you know why, why are they there and that you've got a very clear mission. And this goes back to another talk that I sat in on earlier about ESG, right? how we think about diversity. That's, that's been our big, if you will, um, knock on wood, uh, calling card has been able to attract the, the people who really have this as a mission for themselves. And, and yes, I understand, and we have definitely lost, you know, uh, from a retention standpoint, but I know it's been, if from what I've been heard anyway, less than what our CDMOs have experienced in the same sort of general technology space. And so it is a challenge, but you know, I think things are been flowing around all of this too. And unfortunately, um, you heard earlier with the pandemic, right, that you know, the, the needs have evolved in terms of what the business can, can, can take on. I think it's affecting us, right? I mean, two years ago, nobody talked about supply chain at the dinner room table. Now everybody knows what the hell that means, right? And so that's become a much different situation than it was two, three years ago when we are. So that pressure is going to be a little tougher. And maybe one last question. Probably over here, please. Yeah. And then we'll come to you next. Yeah, sorry. Hi, my name is Rowan Walrath. I'm the life sciences reporter for the Boston Business Journal. Um, Vivek, you raised a point early on in this panel that biomanufacturing jobs are attractive and perhaps right for building talent pools in part because they require a lower level of educational attainment. You also mentioned that you know there's a really diverse talent pool and I, I imagine the two are sort of linked. What I've spoken to executives about in the past is there's this fear that we end up creating two tiers of life sciences workers where we have a lot of people of color who are working by manufacturing jobs and other folks working in R&D jobs. How do we avoid that outcome? Might there be a pipeline from a biomanufacturing job into an R&D job within a company, mm -hmm. for instance? Thank you. I think any of the panelists? So I can jump in there. You know, I, I mentioned the, the BTEC Center in North Carolina. Um, you know, so they have some very good training for, regardless of your level, level of education, for experienced workforce you know, to retool themselves you know, that's been successful there. Uh, but they also have some really good uh, uh, short degree programs um, or uh, in some kind of master's programs that are a year, be a year and a half beyond a BS. And, um, and I've seen those people come in from the BS or the MS and like just really do well. And a model I really like to see is when you bring those talented people on the manufacturing floor 
for a few years, they worked their way through to some of these, uh, you know, um, manufacturing science technology, mm -hmm. our process development, you know, into the labs uh, through that path. And those, yeah. I mean, a good process development lab has, you know, almost half of those people and half of the PhDs, which actually, yeah. uh, by the way, the, the, the scientist levels in our industry is extremely diverse. You know, a lot of people from overseas. Exactly. Um, yeah. uh, so it's a it's fun, fun group of people yeah. to work with. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would add just a minute, just I mean, a lot of those, you know, some of the um, positions that may require lesser education, I, I, some of them are even more skilled and harder to yeah. find, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Finding a, a yeah. mechanic who can take apart a yeah. centrifugal pump, clean it, yeah. rebuild it, that's, that's yeah. something that, you know, is not easily, you yeah. know, not easy to come yeah. by. Yeah. So, I think the, the, the only other point I would add is that uh, the profile of manufacturing jobs also over the last few years I think it's also evolving, right? Um, uh, there used to be a time, you know, sort of a, a few years back in small molecule manufacturing where that job was kind of, you know, sort of, it wasn't as cool as the R&D job. But now when we see manufacturing happening in some of the advanced modalities, and I, I think with automation, digital, AI, you know, those jobs are also now very, I would say, cool jobs, right? So I think overall, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the gap between a profile or a status of a manufacturing job as compared to an R&D job, I think that gap is coming down as well. And I think, uh, um, so I can speak for a lot of my clients who I serve, is that I think diversity is a big topic in R&D as well. And I think um, um, that there have been substantial sort of evolve uh, evolution happening there as well, right? So I think it's a priority across both manufacturing as well as uh, the R&D profiles. Maybe one last question, maybe at the back over there. Hi, yeah. I Here, a little bit different comments. Actually, our manufacturing people make a lot of money, and that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, our clients don't want to pay sometimes. So, because they're like, oh, we're going to go to China and make this happen there. Like, women own a company, no one's helped me in anything. No state done except the internship program. So, thank you, NLC. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, because we really started on that. But, uh, but manufacturing people are very expensive, and actually have like a riot at the company because Moderna is paying everyone one forty five, forty thousand dollars for the just was here. And I literally, if I do the same thing, so to be able to mute me on the ship right now, and uh, because my clients don't want to, they're like asking for discounts. So we're in this peculiar economy where the employees, there's still inflation yeah. going on, and employees are asking for a lot, but my clients don't want to pay. And half of them bankrupt. So they've also been <laughs> paying me, so they owe me millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Some of the should be situated yeah. <laughs> because obviously, how do you survive as a manufacturing company? So here's yeah. this like, we're talking about America giving manufacturing jobs. No help from anyone. <laughs> but, um, you know, otherwise, how do you do it? So yeah. I almost feel like we need like, a low high school level labor. That we could train, maybe they would be a little bit less expensive because they would be probably happy not to work in McDonald's. <laughs> and so we could be all these happy people working in that, like, rather than all this grant or like people that want to pay $200,000 because they're not paying for that, are uh, paying that much. So this is the biggest, like, yeah. I have, like, hands on, like, this, you know, problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, I'm sorry to hear. <laughs> it's uh, uh, bankrupting clients yeah. and no, I, I think it's a classic example of the challenges we're facing in the state. I'm sorry, uh, I've seen like, uh, uh, you also yeah. want to add a comment? Yeah. Uh, just to address a few of the comments, so I'm John Weaver with the Biotech Incubator in Worcester that helped launch the biomanufacturing park out that way. And for the people complaining about the biomanufacturing workforce challenges, we're literally there to help you. Um, so we've created a group out there called the Biomanufacturing Workforce Initiative. We're bringing these groups together and we have some funding that we get through the Commonwealth to put towards creating new programs, like certificate programs for those oh, yes. by manufacturing technicians straight out of school. So I will find you later and we'll <laughs> chat about that. Um, but help is on the way and we'd be happy to engage with you. So. No, I think that's great. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Yeah. There's so much momentum and support for exactly this issue. It's the centerpiece 
we're hoping to launch some new programming with our various partnerships that we're leveraging all across the state. So we hear you. We're going to school in North Carolina. We're going to school in Ireland. So I'm glad you're both of those examples. But you're right. High school level, vocational schools, technical schools, new folks in the industry that haven't thought about these careers for exactly that problem and, and those two. I think fantastic sort of All comments. Right. Thank you. So I think, of course, uh, we have a bunch of challenges, but seems like you know uh, we also have a bunch of ideas. And I think most importantly, we have that vision and you know sort of uh, we have that intent. So hopefully, as this becomes a priority, I'm sure manufacturing uh, can thrive in the state as well. So I think on that note, thank you to all the panelists and to all the audience for your participation. Thank you.